Hi everybody, welcome along to HBC Tech Shorts, where every week we take you to the HBC Engineering Water Cooler here in AWS. And we talk to some of the interesting engineers and architects who are making the cloud a better place for HPC. Um, this week we're going to talk about containers, uh, which is often a controversial topic in HPC. Some people swear by them, some people swear about them. Um, if you've, you know, if you talk to any bioinformaticians, containers have been super important in being able to turn really, really complex workflows like this thing to the right here uh, into portable packaged up things that can be that can be literally shared. Um, you know, every node in this directed acyclic graph is a separate process. It's just, and in fact, in implementation, it typically ends up as a separate container. Each one of those things could actually have custom needs, um, you know, individual requirements to make it, make those individual processes run fast. They might have a dependency on GPUs or a particular file system or some other kind of resource that's special. Um, containers give us the ability to virtualize those applications down in a really nice, tight little way. Uh, and to be able to turn the workflow into a description of what containers to invoke when and how the data passes between them. So, you know, tools like Nextflow, big users of containers, and that's what really what's led to them being able to have very portable workflows that a scientist or a researcher in a drug company can just email to each other. Um, it's had a really big impact in that part of the industry. So containers are containers are here in HPC. The real question is, is you know, can we use containers for other other workloads and other techniques? Uh, and and of course the answer is yes. Uh, but it's always qualified yes. So today I'm actually joined by uh, one of my closest colleagues and one of our most senior engineers in the developer relations team, Christian Neep in Berlin. Hey, Christian. Good morning. Hey, Boof. Um, so Christian is our uh, spiritual torchbearer for all things containers and HPC. And Christian's um, you know, responsible for a lot of the targeted guidance that we give back to our product teams here in, our, here in HPC Engineering to make sure that we're, we're tacking ever closer towards a, a reality where um, HPC, you know, containers are a fully-fledged you know, first-class citizen in HPC in all possible respects. So um, uh, welcome, to the, welcome to the show. Um, yeah, where do we want to start? Me. How do we want to start this discussion? Uh, I know you've got some content. Uh, on a whiteboard that we can we can stick up on the screen. How yeah, let's start, start with let's start ahead? with the whiteboard. And um, yeah, as you said, I I bank my head against containers in HPC for the last six or seven years already. So I have quite a quite some scars discussing this topic <laughs> with uh, traditional HPC or with with anyone basically. And I think that's what I would like to clear in the first tech shots about containers, like making sure we are all on the same page about traditional and containerized virtualization, what are the constraints and how we are currently or how customers are using containers in HPC without maybe making a lot of fuss about it. And that's, I think, what we what we are getting to today. Right. And the, and the, and the point is there's options, right? So um, anyway, let's get the whiteboard up on the screen. Uh, there's there's that awesome workflow. Uh, <laughs> that Paolo Di Tommaso showed me. Where do we want to start? Yeah, um, go to the very to top. Yeah. Very top on the left yeah. side. I'm just trying to master this tool here. Um, let's go over here. OK. Yeah. So this okay. is the left-hand uh, side graph. It's, it's one that I used for the, as I said, for the last six years, just to hammer home the points that traditional virtualization and container virtualization is are different things, right? And I think I spent the first three years just explaining that because uh, that's important to understand. With traditional virtualization, you in the early days you emulated a complete virtual machine, right? You emulated the hardware, and on top of this emulated hardware, you were installing your own operating system with your own kernel, your own user land, your own services, and eventually then your application that you really cared about. So you had it to create a lot of overhead and create a lot of uh, additional auxiliary services just to run your web server or just to run your database, right? Um, and and this is a picture from the early days, like early 2000s, um, how this is run. So the hypervisor type two, and on top of this, you have your virtual machines. And this is this is really why 
this was why in the early days, you know, HPC folks were suspicious of virtualization because you had an operating system running inside an operating system. <clears throat> um, and I mean, we've 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 done a lot of work. I mean, the, the 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 entire industry and the community have done a lot of work on this. But in particular, in AWS, we've we've built Nitro more recently in the last few years, which has collapsed tons of this stuff and actually moved it out into a separate processor that's outside the motherboard, so that we actually have most of the hypervisor functions that get that they get done on our on our fleet are actually done in in specialized hardware. That actually means it's really secure, but it also it also means that you know a, a, a customer using one of our instances gets something that that's indistinguishable from like from bare metal from a performance point of view. So we sort of address some of those things, but how does that how does that get reflected in containers? Yeah. So if we look at the on the right hand side, container virtualization. No, 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 not yet, not oh, yet. No. Yeah, not here yet. you go. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> container Sorry. virtualization. We don't use a hypervisor here, right? We are using the same host kernel and we are abstracting on top of the host kernel that is already running on the system. So we don't need to emulate hardware. We don't need to do hypervisor um, mechanics here and, and, and gymnastics. We are using kernel functionalities like namespaces and C groups to just isolate processes from each other. So we will start a process, in this case, app A in a container. And this process is not able to look on uh, resource, like look up resources on the host. It cannot see processes running alongside on the on the other containers. So it's just isolating the process from its peers, from other containers, but also from the host system. So the, it's basically just a view that has changed. The process is forked with a different view on resources and no way of interacting with other resources except the ones that are tied to the container. And I can show a little example that illustrates this a little bit. So yeah, let me yeah. please let me show switch me, to show the... me something. That'd be good. So Maybe. what I'm showing is just how you're not content... showing anything. Do you want to share your desktop? Oh, so... hit the share button. Ha! It'll <laughs> change everything. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, so. Namespaces, as I said, are just views on resources. And for like in Linux, we have a couple of those. And I just have a couple of here uh, as, an, as an example. We have a mount namespace that shows you your actual file system. You have a pit namespace that shows the processes running on the host. And if you fire up, when you fire up a Linux uh, instance, you will have those namespaces. What containers are, they are essentially a group of processes forked with its own view on those resources. And let me give you a little example here. It makes it a little bit clearer. Um, so here I'm, I'm just listing all the processes on my host. So this is all the processes, like all the five top processes on the, on the system here. I'll show my network interfaces. And this is like the normal namespace that the Linux system created when it was booted up. If I'm doing this with containers, I will start a process, like a container, with the process ps-ef. Mm -hmm. And since I'm getting my own pit namespace, this pit namespace is empty, except the process uh, is, is within it is a, the process ps-ef, right? So I have only one process in my, in my container, and I'm only seeing the one process that I started. If I do this, with uh, with Sleep40 process, so here I'm starting a container that is just issuing Sleep40 as a process. And then yeah. I'm looking from the host what processes are within the host namespace, within the host. And the, the kernel can see the processes that are running within the container. So even though the container is, or the Sleep40 process is containerized, the host has full control over all the processes. So if you type payers minus EF on the host, you will see all the processes, even though they are running within the container. So the view, the namespace view, is constrained for containers. But of course, for the kernel and for the user on the host, for a user on the host, you can see all the processes. Because it's just a process just started in a different way. Got it. And the same goes for network. So if we start a container, it will get its own network namespace. It, get loop, it gets a loop. Um, loop mount uh, loop uh, interface and also an ETH zero that is part of uh, the nutted network that the container engine created. So that's very pure containers that we can see here. But the the interesting bit is, and the the really interesting bit for containers is that you can share namespaces. So for instance, I can create containers that are using the same namespace 
the pit namespace, for instance, or the network namespace of the host, which makes me uh, makes possible to run maybe an HTTP or a web server on the host with the same IP address, even though it's a containerized process. And let me show you a little example here as well. Here I'm running the same ps-cf command within a container, but I'm using the pit namespace of the host. So I'm showing the same output as we saw on the um, command that I issued on the host, even though it's containerized, um, but it's just using the same namespace as the host has. So I'm seeing all the processes. I can do the same with the network namespace. So here again, I'm running an Alpine container issuing the IP address command. But since I'm using the network namespace of the host, I'm seeing exactly what the network on the host looks like. This is the same mm -hmm. command issued on the host will show the same output here. And this is really neat. Like you can create containers that pretty much look similar to a process on the host and you can tune this very neatly, very, very uh, accurately and say, what namespaces do you want to share with the host? What namespace you don't want to share? Okay, so far so and good. We know we know HPC customers are usually a bit different, right? Yeah, they are different, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's namespaces, right? This is namespaces that constrain and isolate and isolate uh, processes from each other. But what you also want to do is you want to constrain resources as well. So if I'm running this stress command here, it's just a container that's running stress. He's trying to use two CPUs. And since I'm not constraining the container, he's using 200% of the of CPU. So he's actually using two CPUs. Makes sense. All right, I can do, if I'm doing this, oh, sorry. If I'm uh, constraining the container to only use one, one uh, CPU, container will start, it will again try to use two CPUs, but the container is constrained to the first CPU, so he can only reach 100%. And this is enforced by the kernel, so you cannot get around this. And this is pretty neat when you want to make sure that a container is not overreaching, that a process is not overreaching its resource boundaries. You can also set shares, so you have like one container with a with a share of 100, another one with 50. So the first container can get double the, the CPU cycles than the first one. But um, and it can, um, you can control this very neatly by, by using this CPUs um, sets. Okay. And this goes not only for CPUs, also for memory and IO on the network, uh, on the file system, also for memory. So you can constrain the processes or the containers very neatly with uh, C groups. And okay. And this is all like totally in control of the user. You can, if you want to go to the extreme, and this is maybe a very, a little bit scary command, but if I use this command here, I'm telling the, uh, the engine that I want to run a busy box container. I want to run it in privileged mode, so I don't want to be constrained by, um, by, by, by the limits that, um, that the, the container would, would be confined to. I want to use the PIT namespace, the UTS namespace, and all the different namespaces from the host, and I want to mount in the host system. And this process that I'm started here, it's pretty much indistinguishable with, con with some qualifications, of course, but it's, it's almost- the container that is the entire box. Yeah, it's almost indistinguishable from um, a process that was started as a root on the host itself. And when I change routing to host here, I'm basically like running a privileged process without security constraints on the host. And um, I'm basically just a, yeah, a privileged process on the host using the same file system. So it's, it's essentially breaking out of all the namespaces. And of course, that's scary. And scary example is just to illustrate that containers can be started in a very bare metal way. So you don't need to create a container that uses all the namespaces and all the limitations. And, and this just should just show that containers are not by any means traditional virtualization. They have very powerful um, technologies that you can use and very powerful techniques to let them run unconstrained and let them run with full force. And there's a lot of things you can tweak. All right, well, so far so good. So they're, they're pretty flexible. Um, uh, this, you, you can run them without constraints, which would be happy news for most HPC people because 
they're always a bit suspicious of anything that gets between them and the kernel or more to the point between them and the CPU or between them and the network. So exactly, what, happens yeah. when we, what happens when we start, you know, diversifying? Let's let's imagine uh, some more of those HPC use cases, you know, things like GPUs or fast networks and stuff. How do we how do we start to factor that into the now, let's 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 touch once more, can we go back to the to mirror board? To the mirror yeah, board? yeah. Let me just, just get that up. We just this this shows the the process isolation and the process uh, constraints you can put on. But I would like to touch also on on the second graph that uh, the second picture on the right hand side, right. which shows a slightly yeah. different view, which yep. just shows like an interface view on how an an actual application interacts with the underlying resources, um, the hardware. And the right hand side, I think, is clear. It's a guest virtual a virtual machine that sits on top of a hypervisor, and you can do some um, magic within the hypervisor to make it fast. And as we discussed, AWS Nitro makes it okay. indistinguishable. But on the right hand side, you can see a container. A container is just the application and the libraries um, to drive this application, and then it issues commands against the kernel directly. If we are like talking about traditional containers. And this can 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 be uh, it's very nice because you can tweak the user land to the liking of the application. So you don't need to worry about a system that is running or a service that is running within your your environment that you you need to optimize for an application. You can just free yourself from all this, right? And I have an another extreme of this. If we go back to the screen share, that shows this. Yeah, hang on. Um, this one. Yeah. So what I'm what I'm showing here is a Docker file that just builds a statically compiled Go a Go binary, like this little hello world example, main Go, and then it creates an empty file system, which is this from scratch, uh, from scratch um, command, and it just copies over the static binary from the build container. So what this means at the end is that we will create a container. And I already created this container, by the way, so I can show. Aha, uh -huh. here's one so you liked earlier. This container here, it's just three megabytes big. So it, the only thing that this container contains is just this statically compiled binary. And when I run this, since I don't need any auxiliary services within this or any uh, any systemd or, or something like that, this will just, if I'm copying correctly, this will just run the statically compiled binary, exit, and off you go. So this is a very, very um, nice way of, and this is where, where, where HPC customers, I think, should should be really interested because this means that you can comp uh, you can optimize your your container file system to the liking of the application or to the liking of your of your use you case. Could, so you could get extremely specific inside that container about. The application, the math libraries you're using, the you know MKL, the the version of OpenMPI, and like everything, you could really exactly, get and and also very system cool. tools, right? You could create your own copy command that is maybe more efficient on Lustre than the traditional stock copy command that comes with your operating system, right? You can you can tweak all the different tools that the container provides to run your workload, and you can maybe be very specific about it. And since the container gives you a hash, you can also be very um, it's it's very much it's very pre reproducible because it's it's like a git commit hash. You could say run me this container with this hash, which means it's very it's fixed. The container right. file system is fixed. Everything is hashed, so you can run this container um, and the, the exact container very easily on other systems as well. So it makes it very easy to reproduce, which is why like bioinformatics and IAML customers they they love this right because you can. Bundle your the weirdest R packages you can find and the weirdest Python packages into a container and then just have it run. And if you need to rerun this a, a year later, since it's super isolated from the underlying host, you can just run it again and you can make sure that you run the same exact binaries or the same libraries within the container. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. Okay. So that that should be really attractive to most HVC folks. So. Where where does it where does the attractiveness of this stuff get complicated? Let's talk about that because I and in we've only got a few minutes left for for this episode. We're going to have to come back and and keep talking some more. Um, I think we need we, we're going to need three or four of these things maybe. 
but let's yeah. let's talk about that. What are what are the what are the things that most people start? You know, where do, where does the friction come in, right? Because every everything you've described so far is perfect and yeah. and would be ideal for most HPC users. But but lots of folks are you know still skeptical about these things and and presumably for some good reasons. Yeah, let's go back to the um, to the, the whiteboard. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna bring that up. There we go. And let's go down to the first challenge. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm clicking on the wrong part of the screen. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, okay. Yep. Yeah. So far, we we talked about the mechanisms, right? So how containers actually work, how they are isolated and constrained, and we just touched on how containers enable like easy packaging, reproducibility, and and portability of those packages amongst different systems because they are the pure form of containers that I that I showed so far. They only rely on CPU cycles like compute, storage, and network to run. Right? They are not. They have no um, other um, other dependencies on the host. They just want a CPU to run some cycles. They want to use the network and so on. And everything is handled and abstracted above the kernel. So. That abstraction is pretty, pretty simple, pretty stable uh, for for many many years, and um, this is what they are using, right? So, mm -hmm. if you are, for instance, an AI ML researcher and you don't know how to install TensorFlow on your own system, you can just use a container, and uh, being done with it, you download TensorFlow and then you run it in a container, and you don't need to install anything. You don't need to install your own Python environment with libraries you need. You just download the nightly build from uh, TensorFlow and off you go. And I have a little example of how this works. If you switch screens again. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh. Here we go. Okay, so let me run a CPU container here. So that one is just using the TensorFlow stock container with version 114. I'm going to run a CNN benchmark here, benchmark with TensorFlow using only the GPU, and I'm using the ResNet 50 model. So if I'm starting this fella here, so first download the image, which is the installation piece, right? Mm -hmm. And it's pretty, pretty, pretty fast. I will just start to visualize at the at the bottom of the of the screen i will do docker stats which just shows me which just shows me the running containers and the resource usage of those containers so once the container gets started we will see a line popping up that um, shows the cpu usage and memory usage of the container so here we go so it's going to one CPU, and once it warms up and it gets starting crunching, then it will use the CPUs to its fullest. So 400%, Bunch. I think that's what the container is going to do. And this is like, we'll tuck along, we'll uh, run containers, uh, we'll run the, the benchmark very easily, but it's only using the CPU, right? So that's where we know now, and we know for, for a long time now that GPUs are very attractive for those use cases. Yeah. So in the next challenge, like in the next column, we will talk about how we can interrogate uh, GPUs to this. But essentially what I'm showing here is it just runs the container as application without installing it because everything is nicely packaged within a container. And if we go to the Miro board and look at the second challenge. Uh, yeah. Okay, here we go. Yep. <clears throat> So this like first column we, we ticked off, right? Traditional H containers just run nicely on, on all kinds of instances and of course also on very powerful ones. But if we want to get one step further with AI or with also um, with also like molecular dynamics or other codes that can utilize a GPU on a single node very nicely, then we want to use a GPU. And this is where NVIDIA really jumped on containers very early on. They hacked first, but then made it a very mature model to integrate GPU use into the container runtime, the Docker runtime specifically. And um, I can show how this works 
yeah. on uh, on the screen again. So if we screen, switch back, back, to back to... yeah. So everyone is maybe familiar with this SMI command. This will just show the the GPUs available on the host, and I can use the Docker runtime with NVIDIA Magic involved, like the NVIDIA hook that uh, allows uh, or prepares a container to use GPU. So what it's doing is it's just um, mapping in the devices that you need to access containers, which is a, a, a couple of NVIDIA uh, devices that you, you can find here. Yeah. And it will also make sure that you have the right CUDA driver within the container. So, and this is, this is a pretty neat feature of, of CUDA, by the way, because CUDA is very backwards compatible. So here we can see I'm running a container that has 9.2, CUDA 9.2 within the container. But on the host, I have the latest 11.0 CUDA driver version. And this hook Back to uh, that we'll make sure. reproducibility, you, you're keeping the, the, the runtime versions very static uh, and very stable. Exactly. And I can do this with different runtimes here, right? So this is CUDA runtime 10. And if you have a GPU or a code that can leverage a GPU, you can just compile it with your favorite runtime using an upstream container, and then you run it on a host very easily um, by using this, this um, hook that the container that prepares a container for use of GPUs. And the same goes, of course, and we will talk about this next time, but the same goes for interconnects like EFA. Similar process, you need to map in a device from the host. You need to make sure that the driver in the container and the driver on the host are, are similar, and then you can use uh, a, a device right. that's on the host. And so that's probably that's probably a neat place to stop. Because, but the, I guess the point the point you're making there is that um, so so for folks who, you know watching at home don't know about it, you know Elastic Fabric Adapter or EFA that we often talk about. That's our version of a of a um, super fast interconnect in the cloud for you know for providing you know all of the networking that you need to be able to get really good scalable performance out of our MPI codes and and other such things. So TensorFlow uses it uh, because it's using Nickel uh, on top of LibFabric and it's LibFabric is the is the real uh, engine behind EFA, um, or at least that's the interface layer that everybody uses to access it. So so this means you know we can. This means we can access actual accelerators. We can access specialized networking. We can do a whole lot of stuff inside inside a containerized environment. So, the, I guess the you know the original suspicions, many of the suspicions folks had about containers in HPC from some years ago, uh, you know, the point is things have changed, things have updated, right? Yeah, and things advanced as well. And we will talk about HPC runtimes in the in the, in the next episode, but. Um, even for like traditional CPU bound or, or GPU um, applications, C containers are very easy to use. And we see this as you, as you alluded to already, like in a lot of customers using containers with AWS batch to, to run their workloads at scale. So pretty yeah. much what we see already. And cool. in the background, you can see that now I downloaded the TensorFlow with GPU support and we will see that this Tesla V100 GPU will fire up and it will be used and utilized for TensorFlow to run. Neat. All right. Well, hey, uh, we're going to have to break there because you know we're otherwise we'll we'll get too far over our our time limit. But um, uh, for anybody who's interested in this topic generally and wants to dive in a bit more detail, Christian did. Um, uh, Christian was heavily involved in in Fosdem uh, uh, Dev Room in the HPC Dev Room at Fosdem this year. Uh, which is an open source conference. So there's, there's a bunch of talks about containerization in HPC. He's also got, you know, we'll put some links into the show notes as well because, you know, he's, he's been chairing the, the container breakout sessions at uh, ISC for the last how many years? Six, Six. years, going strong on the seventh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, are, you are a dedicated man. Um, so so we'll, put some, we'll put some of the links in the show notes. Uh, the last thing to say, that, you know, this is just the first of a series of, of shows that we're going to do on this topic. So we'll be back in a, in a week or two to talk about, uh, you know, more on this theme. Um, if you have ideas about stuff that you'd like to see us covering these shows, uh, uh, levels of depth that you want us to plumb to, uh, interesting topics that you want us to engage in, please do find us on Twitter. Our DMs are open. 
uh, uh, click the like button below if you like what you're seeing. Click subscribe and share it with your friends and your colleagues if you if you think that they should be watching as well. Really appreciate your attention and your time this week. Um, uh, we'll catch up with you sometime next week uh, for you know for the next installment. Thanks everybody and thanks for coming, Christian. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you.